Welcome to chapter six. In this chapter, we're going to see forces show up again, like we saw back in chapter four and five, and acceleration like we saw originally in chapter two. But the most important and fundamental new idea in chapter three is the idea that circular motion, when objects move in circles, there is a net force that is causing that circular motion. And we're going to investigate how to deal with that in problem solving. So in this first video, we are going to lay the groundwork with some kind of core, small but fundamental definition kind of tools that we'll be using in the core part of the chapter, which comes up in a later video. So the first idea is that we need to make sure that we know how to describe the motion of an object that is going around in a circle. The radius of that circle is hopefully something we've seen in a previous class and understand will be part of our, our discussion here in chapter six of Physics 125 as well. But when we think about our discussion of speeds, and velocities and distances and displacements from chapters two and beyond, we've been talking in terms of meters and meters per second. However, when we are stuck in a circle and we are going through and coming back around to the same spot over and over again, it is also really useful and important to be able to talk about angular distances and angular speeds, and those won't use the units of meters and meters per second. If we have a circle of radius r, and an object moves from point A to point B along that circle, then we can describe its arc length using the letter s. I know arc length doesn't have the letter s in it, but that's what we're going to use. And the angle that it moved through, if you were to draw a line from the center to point A and from a center to point B, the angular distance that it moved through, we use the Greek letter theta, and it is defined as the arc length divided by the radius. Now, the textbook, you might see the change in angle is equal to the change in S position, I guess, um, over R. It describes the same idea. We're not going to have deltas following us all over in chapter 6 here. We're pretty much just going to use the simpler theta equals S over R. But no matter how you want to think about it, the units of physical arc length would be in meters, and the units of radius, another physical length, would be in meters. So if we think about theta, it is based on an equation that is the units of meters divided by the units of meters. Those would cancel out, leaving us with nothing at all. So what, our, what are our units for angle? It turns out we actually have to introduce this unit that acts a little bit strange. Radians are not a unit in the same way that meters, kilograms, and seconds are. They are a natural unit. And what that means is they're dimensionless. It's the only unit of its kind that we will see in our curriculum. It is not the only unit that exists that has these properties. But it fundamentally doesn't have a dimension. So not length or width or height. And so it kind of acts like magic. The best way I can describe it is that although we've been trying to train ourselves to follow the units around in the problems, radians are a little bit magic and they can just go poof into existence, uh, a cloud of glitter if we want to, and they show up when they need to, and they can go poof out of existence whenever we have units to um, put in the spot that they would normally sit in. We're going to see a couple of examples here just so that we get the hang of it. If you need to rewatch these examples to make sure that you understand how I'm describing radians appearing and disappearing, that's perfectly fine. In a lot of cases, students haven't used radians before, and so this is kind of the toughest part of chapter six, but it really isn't meant to be complex as long as we kind of just acknowledge that radians are weird. We can put that in our notes if we need to. Radians are weird, exclamation point, highlight it. Um, and we just need to get used to them. So here's an example. If we have a circle of radius 80 centimeters, and we're looking at an arc length S of 60 centimeters, 
With those two numbers in mind, what would the angle theta be that describes the portion of the circle that we're looking at? So if we think back to the equation that we had on the previous slide, theta is equal to s over r. And so with our given information, we actually don't need to change the units because they will cancel out 0 0.75. Or if we did want to um, get ourselves used to and continuing to think about meters as our standard length unit, we could have 0 0.6 meters divided by 0 0.8 meters. We'll still get to 0 0.75. Now, it is extremely, extremely important that we train ourselves that we absolutely cannot just have degrees show up randomly because we're used to theta in degrees. That is going to cause major physics issues if we do that. Instead, when there is no unit at all on, an, on a uh, quantity that we know to be an angle, radians are able to have their cloud of glitter, poof, they come into existence because we need them there, and they show up on our um, final answer here. So the answer is 0.75 radians, or three quarters of a radian. All right, here's another example. This is helping us to understand that as long as we have any two of the three values, r, theta, and s, we can use this relationship between them to find the third. Whenever these variables come up in problems, we need to be comfortable with thinking about theta as an angular distance and not just the thing that goes into sine and cosine. So if we have a radius of 2 meters and we're looking at an angular distance of 1.2 radians, what would the arc length be for that situation? Pause the video if you can and try this on your own to make sure that you are thinking not just about how to, um, not just how to multiply the numbers together, but what the final units are going to look like. So 1.2 radians times 2 meters, as soon as there are other units attached to it in the same spot, the radians go poof out of existence and we don't need them anymore. We get 2.4 meters and we specifically do not write down 2.4 radian meters or meter radians. We can drop the radians unit away because the meters is sitting in that spot already and we don't need it. Like I said, radians are kind of weird, but we'll get used to them. Okay, so let's think about what we might already know about a circle. If we think about the full circumference of a circle, and this is something that has been at, on our equation sheets and will continue to be on our equation sheets. You don't have to have it memorized, but if it is something that's already in your head, the circumference of a circle is 2 pi times the radius, 2 pi r. Now, how many degrees are in one full circle? And right here, I already used the phrase one full revolution. We also need to get to uh, the idea that revolutions is a description of making a full circle, and it is itself a unit. So one circle is one revolution of angle, and there would be 360 degrees of angle. So if we thought about our... Um, definition of angular distance, theta, if the arc length is a full circumference, 2 pi r, divided by radius, then r on top and bottom cancels, and the full circle in terms of radians would be 2 pi, 2 pi radians. So the circumference of a circle, 2 pi r, divided by the radius, because that's the definition of theta, we get two pi radians are in one circle, in one revolution, that's the way to describe a full circle, and 360 degrees is what we've been used to. Now, it's important to note that the very first conversion here, 360 degrees equals two pi radians, that's the reason why your numbers will be so drastically wrong if you set your calculator to radian mode instead of degree mode because it's thinking that you have a number that is 360 degrees um, different, or 360 degrees divided by 2 pi, a very different number than what you actually are trying to put in there. Now, it is really important for us to make sure that we understand the difference between how we're using theta here in chapter 6 and how we have seen it in previous chapters. 
If we are using the sine, cosine, and tangent buttons on our calculator, the context of when that shows up, we still are going to use degrees. We aren't talking about angular distances in that, um, in that kind of context. We're talking about maybe vectors at angles, which still um, show up here. So you'll still keep your calculator in degree mode. When theta is all by itself here in chapter six, it is angular distance, it will be in radians, but we do not need to tell our calculator that. If we think about it, we have never needed to tell our calculator if we're multiplying meters by anything or miles by anything. It's only when we use those special functions. So for our entire course, we will stick with degree mode and not radian mode. But this second conversion is one that we've probably not really seen before, but will be our more used um, conversion. One revolution is an object has made one full circle all the way around, and that's the word that comes up all the time. If you have seen RPMs show up, whether it's on the dashboard um, or the console of your car, or if you have a record player at home, RPM is revolutions per minute. We're going to see that unit all throughout this chapter in example problems in the same kind of way that we see miles per hour show up all the time in chapter two, even though we know that we have to turn it into a different set of standard units. So for an object circling, we already know about speed from chapter two. The idea that there is distance traveled over elapsed time. For a circle, it works the same way. For a circling object, sometimes we refer to this as linear speed or tangential speed so that we can differentiate it from things that are going to show up in a couple of slides. The tangential starts to tell us what direction this vector, if we were to turn it into a velocity, is actually pointing. It's tangent to the circle at all points. But the number value, which would be the speed, the amount of this is distance traveled over elapsed time. And if we're going around and around a circle, that distance is going to be the arc length S. And the elapsed time will be T, the way we've been using it since the very end of um, chapter two and beyond. The units of this tangential speed are just meters per second, exactly like they were back in chapter two. So this is not fundamentally a new idea. We just want to recognize that it is not using displacement because if we go once around a circle and come back the way that we, uh, to the point we started, our displacement is zero and that's not helpful for us. Tangential speed is helping us to recognize that we can go around and around and around, racking up distance as we do that. So now our other new quantity from chapter six is angular speed. So speed was distance traveled over elapsed time. Angular speed is angular distance traveled over elapsed time. So by definition, the angular distance is theta. Elapsed time is t. And so we have this new equation here. The Greek letter omega, please don't call it w. It has a name. It's called omega. The Greek letter omega is in radians per second because on top, theta, that's something measured in radians, and on the bottom, time, our standard unit of time is seconds. When we see something described in radians per second, we need to get it into our um, mental framework that that is telling us about angular speed. In the same way that in a problem, if we saw something in the units of meters per second, our brain tells us that that's speed or velocity. Radians per second needs to be just as um, comfortable after some practice in our heads. This slide may be useful to just pause the video and write out fully into your notes, or you can access the posted slide, that's slide number nine here in chapter six. But it really lays out the idea that these two letters, the Greek letter theta and the Greek letter omega, they're going to show up just as often as V for velocity, A for acceleration, F for force, just as often as the others. We just need to get a little comfortable with them because we tend not to use the Greek alphabet all that often in everyday life. It tells us what it's used for. It tells us what equation, uh, what units it should be. 
and the equation at the bottom, how these two new ideas are related to each other. Okay, so let's think about a couple of small examples. So these won't have their own separate example video. We will have larger ones that we kind of cut to that separate video for. But I want us to, if we have the time and ability, we, I want us to pause the video and try this on our own if we're feeling comfortable with it. And then um, I'll be presenting the solutions. So here we have a turntable that rotates at 78 revolutions per minute. I want you to think about what kind of unit that really is describing. Revolutions, is that a um, physical length? Is it an angular distance? Things like that. Minute, we probably can guess is a unit of time. We're asking to calculate its angular speed in radians per second. So angular speed is going to mean we're using this new idea, Greek letter omega, and the new either equation for it, or we might recognize that this is really just a unit conversion problem. So pause the video if you haven't yet, and you can. Okay. So 78 revolutions per minute is sometimes going to be listed as RPM. It's a very common unit that we will see for angular speed, omega. So if we look, we can just use this as a unit conversion problem. We start with revolutions per minute. Revolutions to radians is a conversion factor we saw a couple of slides ago. Minutes to seconds is a conversion factor that we're hopefully very familiar with from everyday life. We plug stuff into our calculator, we get our result. It's not meant to be a complex algebra problem. It's meant to make sure we recognize that these new ideas have new units that we have to become comfortable with. All right. Now, this slide here has really functionally what's called the derivation. It is showing us where a new equation comes from based on prior stuff that we've seen. You know, don't have to redo this derivation ever again, and it's not all that um, lengthy, but I want us to at least recognize where the comparison between physical speed and angular speed comes from. So if we start with the definition, and I wrote it on the far left here in black, the definition of angular speed, omega equals theta over t. If I multiply both sides by r, and I did that in green, I'm always allowed to do anything to a, um, an equation if I do it the same on the left as the right. Then I've circled in blue the fact that r theta is equal to s, and so I've replaced it in blue in the next step. Then when we have s over t, I've circled that in purple because s over t is the tangential speed. And so with just a couple of identifications and replacements, we end up with our um, other new tool that we'll have access to on an equation sheet that we'll be using all the time that the radius times the angular speed is equal to the tangential speed. In a way, radius is kind of like the conversion factor of sorts between angular kind of quantities and physical kind of quantities. We'll see that a lot more in chapter 10. All right, so here's another smaller example where we train ourselves on how to apply our standard problem solving process to these problem types. If we think back way back to the start of chapter two, we had a problem solving process that we tried to apply as often as we could. Step one, we draw a picture. We'll be drawing lots of small circles here. Step two, identify the given information. What I'd like you to do is read through this problem and try to write down not just the numbers that you see, but label them with the letter, maybe a Greek letter, um, that they are referring to. So try to make that list of given information, and then we'll go through the solutions to this, um, to this smaller example. So pause the video if possible. Okay. So we see the picture. We see the list of given information. We had a diameter, so we had to divide it by two. The other thing we really, really want to train ourselves to do is just to constantly put stuff into the standard units that it's supposed to be in, even before we get to choosing equations. So the radius needs to be in meters. 
500 revolutions per minute, we've just started to talk about the fact that revolutions per minute should be telling us about angular speed omega. We put that into radians per second. And then if we think about our problem solving process, step one, the picture, step two, the given information, step three, identify what we're looking for. We are asked for the speed in meters per second, so we're looking for V. Step four is to choose the equation to use. Anytime we're trying to look for an equation, we're looking for something that contains all the stuff in our list of givens and the thing that we're trying to solve for. And so R omega equals V is the equation that's going to be useful to it, and I've written it in red here. Step five, we plug in numbers, and we get 3.98 meters per second, in step six, we check to see if that seems reasonable. That's a pretty slow speed. A grinding wheel, we think, could probably handle that because cars go way faster. There's a note here at the bottom of the um, slide that it is possible to just avoid the idea of radians entirely if we think about each revolution as having a distance of one circumference. That is fine if that makes sense to you. We probably won't be presenting that solution in a lot of the like posted solutions, but it leads you to the same correct result. And if that makes more sense to you, please feel free to um, recognize that as a possible path. All right, now if we think about these two conversion ideas between angular ideas and physical ideas, We've been presenting them in terms of an object that is spinning in place. But this works too for an object that is rolling across a, um, a surface. If an object rolls without sliding, so when we say without sliding, something that just slides across is not rolling. There's got to be that rolling motion. When an object rolls, every time that it makes one full rotation, it has also moved one full um, circumference forward. So this, this tries to indicate that a little bit. And in class, we have a disk that we roll across the table and discuss that for. But fundamentally, what that really means is that for objects that roll, our idea of arc length is also going to be equal to their forward distance x, the same kind of x from chapter 2. And the tangential speed of a piece along the wheel's edge is equal to the forward speed of the object itself. So our understanding from chapter two for distances and speeds is still applicable here for rolling objects. So let's think about having a basketball. It has a radius of 14 centimeters. And if it rolls across the room at a speed of 30 miles per hour, what is its rotation rate? Now first, it's worth noting that rotation rate means an angle per time. Rotation rate is another way to describe angular speed. That might be worth writing down in your notes. Rotation rate is another name for angular speed. So just like the previous small example, we're going to try to apply our standard problem solving process, draw a picture, make a list of the given information and put it into the right units, identify what we're looking for, and I'm telling us here it's angular speed, find an equation, plug stuff in. So pause the video and try to do that on your own. The very best way to figure out if stuff is making sense is to see where you're getting stuck before you see me work it out, because it tends to look fairly smooth when I work it out, because I don't have the sticking points, but it's worth finding yours as soon as you can. So, hopefully you've paused, you've tried it, you're starting back up again. All right, so we've got the basketball picture, little um, arrow sideways to indicate it's moving forward. We've put the radius in units of meters, we've put the speed in units of meters per second, and we've identified that omega is what we're looking for. So that angular speed omega is equal to V over R. We could start with R omega equals V and divide both sides by R. We plug in our numbers, and we realize that our units would come out to be 1 over seconds. But radians are magic, remember? Cloud of glitter. They show up because they're needed, and so we end up with radians per second instead of empty space per second. 
So omega here would be 95.8 radians per second. Okay. This is a similar example. It's a little bit longer. So it's going to get its full own separate example video. It's our first one from chapter six, but certainly not our last. And so it will be worth seeing how much you can do um, based on our previous smaller examples before you get a chance to watch the video and then see how, um, how on track you were. The last couple of things to note, this is a kind of long initial video, um, but it's kind of just introducing a bunch of smaller concepts that we all need um, to have before moving on to the bigger stuff, is that if we go one full circle around, one revolution, and we know how long that takes, rather than just a generic and general idea of elapsed time, if we know we've gone exactly one circumference, that time is called a time period. We're going to use a capital T because we're using P for pressure way off in the end of the problem or end of the semester. And so for a constant speed, things going around in circles, their speed is 2 pi r, the circumference, over the period. Capital T is a very different idea than lowercase t elapsed time. For angular speed, it's the same kind of thing. 2 pi is one full circle worth of angle, and that capital T has a very specific meaning. It is the amount of time it takes to go that one full circle. So a quick example to see how this works, we're going to recognize that this pair of equations becomes very useful to us towards the end of the chapter. But for now, we want to at least get a chance to see how it looks. So let's try with the Earth and the Sun. That is close enough to a circle to apply our physics in this chapter to it. If the Earth is 93 million miles from the Sun, and it's going around in big circles, we want to calculate the tangential speed of the Earth as it goes around. Now the question here asks for miles per second to actually make our math a little bit simpler. And it doesn't give you the period, but if we think about our calendar a little bit, Hopefully we'll figure out what that period is. We're about to see it. And a side note, um, if, if you have no idea how long it takes the Earth to go around the sun, I do teach astronomy too, and I would be happy to help you understand that in Astronomy 102 or 103 at GRCC. All right, to go once all the way around the sun, that's when we celebrate birthdays. It's one full year. So when we look at our picture, it's a circle. Our radius, we're going to keep in miles because we see that we're being asked for miles per second. That time period of one year, we have to put into seconds. And we're asking for the speed in miles per second. So 2 pi times that radius in miles, 9.3 times 10 to the 7th. The time period, 3.15 times 10 to the 7th. What we might see is that we don't even have to type in that um, scientific notation into our calculator. 10 to the 7th cancels on the top and the bottom. But no matter what, you can type it all in if you want to, and you will get a result of 18.6 miles per second. I don't know about you, but if you start to think about yourself whizzing through space at the speed of 18 miles per second, almost 19 miles per second, you get a little bit of dizziness. All right, so that's how fast the Earth is going. We don't notice it because we're also going that fast. Um, there's plenty of speeds that we could talk about in astronomy that will really make you have a touch of vertigo. All right, so that was our kind of last pair of definition tools. This slide summarizes for us all of the new stuff that we just introduced so that you have it all in one place. And the one thing I want to highlight here is that every single one of these new equations, they are basically small definition equations, the same way that at the very beginning of chapter two, we got a whole bunch of small definition equations before we built up real useful tools for our toolkit. So we'll be see seeing how we're going to add these into our bigger understanding for the rest of the chapter in the next video. Thanks for bearing with this somewhat longer um, initial video, but I promise that um, we'll be seeing how to apply all of these in a lot of really cool and interesting circular motion problems. I will see you in the next videos.